Today I'm going to show you what's inside of a five cylinder engine and how it works. So here I've got Volvo's B5244 S4 inline five cylinder engine that has failed. So we're going to be tearing down this scrap engine to see what's wrong with it, what are some of the common points of failure, and what makes it so unique. Now this engine was originally mounted transversely for a front wheel drive 2005 Volvo S40. This is the naturally aspirated version of this engine. At the front here we have the air intake plenum. At the top here we have the valve cover and it's made of metal. It seems pretty chunky and you can see where the five cylinders would be located in these spark plug holes here now just below the air intake we have the oil filter housing and that's going to bolt in from the top as opposed to the from the bottom where the oil can drain out easier this makes for a big mess of an oil change now just around the oil filter we have this box that's going to separate any oil from the crankcase and the valve cover coming through these tubes here before feeding it back into the air intake at the bottom here and taking a look at the back of the engine we have a typical exhaust for any inline style engine now in turbo models this the manifold is built into the head and the turbo would bolt directly to the head. Now this engine is also a dual overhead cam design where we have an exhaust camshaft on this side and a variable intake camshaft on this side which is driven off of this timing belt powered by the crank. First thing we're going to do is pop off the valve cover which is held on by 1 million 10 millimeter bolts. At least they don't use torques like the Germans. And remove the valve cover see just how big this valve cover is and it's all made of metal and it actually integrates the bearings for the camshafts themselves so you don't have to deal with individual cam covers. Now the camshaft also integrates these oil passages and the oil control valve to control the variable valve timing system over here and to lubricate these camshafts. So next I'm going to pull off all these bolts holding the air intake on. All right, now we'll pull off the air intake. We do have this PCV hose here to pay attention to. Now I'm going to remove this coolant passage assembly here. Kind of interesting that something as hot as coolant has to flow through this type of plastic at the thermostat. Now I'm going to remove this assembly here. And we'll just remove that with the oil filter housing. You can see there's some oil passage ports at the bottom here and at the top here. Now over on the exhaust side, I'm going to remove the shield. I'm surprised it isn't completely rusted off. Now this exhaust manifold looks pretty cool. You can see some of the cylinders are really short while some of them are really long. And that's what gives you the alternating pulses and such a sweet exhaust note on these inline five engines. Spray these down with some PB blaster. Now I got I admit this is my first time working on a non-Japanese engine and the first time I'm using my 13 millimeter socket. And I'll remove that header. Now with the exhaust out of the way you can see we have the coolant bypass tube that goes from the water pump side over to the back of the engine. And it's also got these two lines that come down for the oil cooler. Now one thing I do like about this style of oil cooler is that the oil is self-contained inside of the sump. There's no external oil lines that have to run outside to potentially get severed and thus you lose oil pressure and dust your engine. This way if you know if your coolant line gets severed it's okay you can still pull over to the side of the road. Just pull off the cross tube there. And I'll remove the oil cooling line here. Next up I'm going to remove the timing components on the front of the engine. So there's this one Torx here I'm going to remove and then pop off the timing cover. And here's how the timing is set up on this engine with the crank at the bottom here. We have the tensioner here, the water pump here, the two cams at the top and then an idler pulley over here. Now some of these timing covers could get super brittle and if this gets lodged inside of your belt that's not good. I'll just remove this bracket here, good old 13 millimeter socket. Now this is a spring loaded tensioner, there's no hydraulics here. So just remove the idler pulley and you can see that releases the timing belt tension here and the timing belt just jumps right off. You can see that's where the tensioner, you can see that's where the spring is inside the tensioner. Now with no timing belt tension I can remove the cams. Now I'm going to remove this idler pulley and remove the water pump and I'll remove the water pump. Yeah, and I'll just remove this bracket from the timing side. Yeah, and I'll just remove this timing cover. And I can remove the timing belt. Now with the cams and timing out of the way, it's pretty easy to see what this dual overhead cam design looks like. The valves are spaced pretty far apart from each other compared to other inline or even V-series engines. And the spark plug area is pretty big and flat on the top. Here you can see we've got the buckets over here that cover the top of the valve stem and the spring. Now the head bolts are regular 14 millimeter hex style bolts. So I'm going to go ahead and break those free with a breaker bar. Alright, so I got my 14 millimeter on there. I'm going to put this long pipe on it. Give me some leverage. Oh, that's a lot of force. And once all the bolts are knocked loose, I'm going to run them free. And now with all the bolts free, 
I'm going to remove the head from the engine block is that you can make them nice and compact for a front wheel drive vehicle mounted transversely. However, you can see with this design, Volvo has really taken compact to the next level and made the cylinder walls between there really, really thin. Take a look at how thin that is. It's actually less than the thickness over in this region here and more so look at the head gasket. It's really thin in this region here. So my bets are if this head gasket were to blow, it'll probably be between these two pistons. Here you can see when I rotate this engine, how the pistons move up and down. You can see that they don't really have a relative relationship to each other. And that's because it's an odd number of cylinders. I also didn't really notice any compromises in the head gasket or the piston heads themselves. So we're going to turn this engine over and open it up from the bottom. Now that's not how the oil is supposed to look like when it's coming out. It's like oil and cooling kind of mixed together. And it's really watery. So now that the engine has been flipped over, I can remove the lower oil pan here. And you can have a look at what's inside. Now given how milky it looks like inside the oil pan, it seems like oil and coolant has kind of mixed itself up inside of this engine and they don't do each other's job properly. Oil is not a good coolant and coolant is not a good lubricant. And here we have a plastic oil pickup tube. It plugs into the oil pump over here and sucks oil out of the oil sump and you can see just how milky that is. And this whole engine actually has a lot of coolant at the bottom end here where it shouldn't. And you can see that there's actually some particles inside that oil pickup tube. So we know that this engine definitely failed by some means of coolant and oil mixing together. Now I don't know why Volvo would make this out of plastic because it does get relatively hot down here. I should probably just make it out of metal. Now in order to get the crank out we have to take off the upper oil pan from the engine block. Those are held in by these bolts over here. But before we do that we also have to loosen up the main bearing bolt at the top here. We're also going to loosen off the connecting rod cap bolts and I'll just remove that connecting rod cap. So here you can see that this connecting rod bearing is actually spun and it's gone around to the other side leaving a clearance on this side and completely destroying this crankshaft due to lack of lubrication and cooling and it's scored it up. That gap is what's going to cause that knocking sound in this engine so the crankshaft and the connecting rods are toast. So with the crank pulley removed you can see we've got the oil pump here. There's just a couple of torques I have to remove and then it'll come out. And with the bottom end free I can remove the upper oil pan. And with that first piston removed you can see the damage that's inside the connecting rod here. How scored up it is. And you can see these bearings here that spun. It's all chewed up and it's kind of feathered out on this end here. The oil pump has an interesting paper gasket and quite a lot of sludge build up in here. Ew. Now I'm going to remove the crankshaft. And then I can remove the pistons from underneath. Now with the crankshaft removed, check out all the damage and scoring to that connecting rod bearing on piston number one. We've also got some of that on piston number five here. Now the lubrication system on this Volvo five cylinder engine is a little bit different than other engines because it integrates the oil pan and the valve cover and even the air intake into the lubrication circuit. Now the oil system begins its journey here at the oil sump, which has a lot of baffles and webs inside of here to stop oil from sloshing around. We've got this oil pickup tube that's going to bring oil up to the oil pump. Now in the upper oil pan the pickup tube is going to plug into here and that's going to feed the oil pump. Now the oil pump is responsible for providing oil flow and its inlet is over here and its outlet over here routes over to this port which goes back down into the oil pan. Now back at the oil pan the oil is then going to flow down into this tube over here over to the oil cooler that's externally mounted and it's going to exchange heat with the oil cooler and then bring oil back into here over to this port over here back into the upper oil pan. Now in the upper oil pan the oil is then going to be sent out to the oil filter assembly over here and then be filtered out and sent back into the upper oil pan here. Now this oil filter housing assembly integrates the PCV system. Now the oil filter itself is a cartridge style that goes in here and then the lid screws on so that's kind of messy for oil changes. And at the back here we have the inlet and outlet ports for the oil pressure. Now the filtered and cooled oil is then going to make its way into this oil galley here and feed each of these individual six main crankshaft bearings. Now the engine block you can see where the oil galleys lead to the main bearings. Now there's also a port that brings oil up to go all the way up to the head here and it also tees off and goes to this galley over here which runs down the length of the block and those are going to feed these oil sprayers that are going to spray oil at the piston heads to help cool them and lubricate them. Taking a look at the top of the block we have the oil feed that goes to the head over here and then we have four oil return ports over here that bring oil back down through gravity into the sump. Now the top of this block here is an open deck design which means that these water jackets are fully continuous across the whole block and that's typical for a lower horsepower engine that doesn't need any 
strengthening across these pistons. Mind you, the water jacket only goes down about halfway or so, so I really hope that the aluminum does a good job at cooling the bottom half of the combustion chamber. Now the bottom of the head, here's the oil feed tube that's going to feed oil up straight into this cam bearing over here and the return ports at the bottom here. You can see this one's got the water jackets pretty closed up near the top of the head. Now the top of the combustion chamber, there's quite a bit of an angle between these valves and that's because the top of the head here is so wide. You have the camshaft spaced really wide apart from each other and that's going to create quite a bit of an angle for those valve stems. Now the oil to the head is going to first lubricate this camshaft bearing and then be sent into the valve cover for distribution across the head. Now inside the valve cover we have this hole here that comes from the first bearing that's going to first feed the oil control valve for the variable valve timing solenoid located over here. Computer is going to control that to allow the oil pressure to change between these two lines here and that's going to feed the camshaft. Now once it's done with the variable valve timing system, oil is then also going to flow to each individual bearing through these tracks over here. Now each bearing has a little hole here that leads along to the main galley that runs along the middle of the valve cover. Now it seems like this valve cover is shared with vehicles that have variable valve timing on the exhaust side. You can see this one's just got a plug here where the oil control valve would be and these two tracks here that are completely filled with sludge here that would otherwise feed oil to that variable valve timing. Now the downside to having such a complicated lubrication system where you integrate the valve cover and the oil pan is you're introducing more points of error where one of these areas can leak causing a loss in oil pressure and thus oil starvation. Now while these inline five cylinder engines are fairly reliable overall its most talked about point is the PCV system and that's because it's a little bit more than just the valve stuck onto the valve cover. Now the purpose of the PCV system is to ventilate any pressure that's built up because of blow by with the pistons moving up and down in the crankcase and send that vent back to the intake to get reburned. Now this is the oil separator and it's responsible for separating any oily deposits that are on the bottom half of the engine and filtering them back out before going back into the intake. Now when your PCV system is not working properly pressure is going to start building up in the crankcase and through these holes here through the head itself and that's going to cause some seals to blow out like the valve cover gasket, the cam seals or even the oil pan seal. Now this PCV system here connects to the block over here inside of the crankcase now that air is going to be ventilated through this over here and any oil is going to be separated inside of this unit and drop back down through this port here. Now that port corresponds to this one here and that waste oil is then going to drop back down into the oil pan. We've also got another traditional hookup that ventilates the valve cover over here and we have this one here that leads up to the air intake to dispel those fumes. Now the PCV system is going to ventilate directly into the air intake plenum and then that's going to vent directly into the intake valves through these machine ports over here on the head. Now inside of here is a little diaphragm so I'm just going to use my brother's twisted screwdriver here to lift this off and we can see what's inside. Now taking a look inside we have this spring loaded diaphragm here that's going to lock off the seal here that goes over to the intake and then inside of here we have the air that's getting ventilated you can see how oily it is. Now one of the weakest parts on these engines is diaphragm has a crack inside and it doesn't hold its seal so just use my brother's twisted screwdriver again to pull this out so we can see what's inside and it's just a rubber diaphragm. Now you can replace these, however it is quite a job to get to this part over here because of where it's located underneath the air intake. There's a lot of things to remove. Let me see if I can remove the top half of this plastic housing. And then I'll just pop that off. Now taking a look at this PCV system here, at the bottom here we have this little port and it's got this tiny little baffle inside of here and that's basically what forms the separator inside of here. The idea being the oil is going to flow to the bottom and then drip down and then the air is going to make its way up to the top into the air intake. Now at the side here we have this little sensor. It's got a little coil on it and this just looks like a normally closed, normally open sensor but it's also got this little lead here that leads off and comes over to this side over here. Here we have the valve cover ventilation that goes straight into this box here and then we have this one that goes straight into the air intake controlled by the diaphragm. You can see just all the carbon deposits inside of here so once this system gets clogged up you'll see a lot of leaks happening on your engine. Now perhaps the most interesting thing of an inline five cylinder engine is its crankshaft and how the connecting rods are arranged compared to a regular four cylinder. Now because this is a four stroke engine it's going to take four strokes of this piston or two rotational cycles of this crankshaft in order for all the pistons to fire. Now therefore for the two rotations at 720 degrees divided across five pistons we get a power stroke every 144 degrees. Now that means that the connecting rods are going to locate on the crankshaft 144 degrees apart from each other. Now the firing order for this engine is 1, 2, 4, 5, 3 which means that if we have piston number 1 at top dead center number 2 is now 144 degrees apart from it then 144 degrees apart from that for piston number 4 then another 144 for 5 and then finally back here 
to piston number three, and then the cycle starts all over again. Now because there's a piston firing every 143 degrees, when the first piston is making its way down, before it finishes, the second piston is gonna start making its way down, so there's a bit of an overlap in the power strokes. Now that overlap is what's gonna to lead to a smoother rotational torque across this crankshaft and make a five cylinder a little bit more smoother than an inline four cylinder. Now balancing the rotational forces about the crankshaft is also important to engine balance and a five cylinder does do a good job of it. Now if you look at the power versus cycle here, you can see that the power band from the first piston is actually going to overlap the power band of the second piston and all the way down and that overlap is about 36 degrees. That means that this crankshaft is always gonna be receiving power. There's no part in the cycle where it's not gonna have any torque go to it, which is gonna make it a fairly smooth engine. Now, however, inline fives are not very balanced across their horizontal plane because you've got an odd number of cylinders cycling from one side of the engine to the other and back and forth, which is gonna create a rocking motion this way. Now, if not properly balanced with a balanced shaft, the engine's gonna rock back and forth and take its toll in engine mount. Now, if we take a look at the forces inside of the engine, we can understand just how an inline five cylinder is better than a four cylinder, but still not as good as an inline six. Here we have the piston moving up and down on this crank slider mechanism, and it's gonna create a primary force moving from top to bottom and then back up to the top for the complete cycle. Now secondary forces occur twice per cycle and they are created from the inertia of this piston moving up and down which moves faster near top dead center and slower near the bottom dead center. Now both of these forces need to be counteracted through a counterweight as well as the engine configuration and number of cylinders in order to get a smooth running engine. Now taking a look at the engine configuration and engine balance, in order for an engine to be completely balanced the primary and secondary forces as well as the moments about the crankshaft must be completely balanced. And that's where you come to the shortcoming of the inline five cylinder engine because it's got an odd number of cylinders, it's going to create a rocking moment back and forth this way, although its primary and secondary forces up and down are balanced. Now if we compare that to an inline six, which is completely balanced for both primary and secondary forces, there's also no moment created about the middle and that's because you've got an even number of cylinders. So everything on this side cancels each other out with everything on this side. Now comparing that to an inline four cylinder engine, there is no rocking moment and the primary forces cancel each other out because of the piston configuration. However, the secondary forces work constructively with each other to create a lot of vibration in the up and down direction. Finally, if you compare it to a V6 engine, which is basically two three cylinder engines, again, you've got an odd number of cylinders, which is gonna create a bit of a rocking moment about the middle of the crankshaft. And that's pretty much what's inside of a Volvo five cylinder engine and what makes it so unique. Unique. Make sure you follow me on Instagram for more behind the scenes footage and subscribe for more videos just like this one. And check out my new Volvo five cylinder engine coffee table. It's got all five cylinders supporting the glass on the top and all the timing components here. And I've even put in a functional flywheel clock on the back.